Uh, so I wanted to welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us. I'm really excited to have you all here today, uh, even in these troubling tough times we're having with uh, COVID-19. It's a wonderful opportunity for us to come together uh, with some social uh, media here or our digital platform um, and have a really nice educational presentation. Uh, there's a ton of great information that we're going to review in this presentation that we hope is uh, very helpful for everyone. Uh, we're going to make sure we all have the best experience possible. I wanted to go over a couple features you can utilize during the webinar. Number one is our questions feature. Anytime you have a question throughout the presentation, please ask it through the chat feature under the questions tab. We'll be checking that throughout the presentation. The second feature uh, you can utilize is our poll. Uh, we will have one poll question during the presentation that we encourage you to participate in. Third, we will be showing you a video during the webinar. Audio only works if you're using your computer and not your phone. Um, but don't worry, all the videos will have captions. And the last thing I wanted to mention is this presentation webinar is being recorded. So if you'd like to watch it again or share it uh, with someone, a link will be provided in the following in a follow-up email later today, and as well as on our website, solitude.com. Uh, Do a little presentation or uh, meet our panelists today. Uh, I'm on the left there. Believe it or not, that is me from about 10 years ago. Uh, my name's John, and I am an environmental scientist at Solitude Lake Management and a senior business development consultant. I've been with Solitude for close to 10 years. I've been working in the water and land management field for about 20 years. I'm located in the Philadelphia region, servicing Pennsylvania and uh, most of the tri-state area. Um, this is a great topic for me as I have a lot of experience with shoreline uh, stabilization, uh, pond remediation, as well as vegetative buffer establishment the topic will go hand in hand with uh, shoreline stabilization. Next, I'd like to introduce Robin Huffines. On the right there, Robin is the Director of Erosion Control Services at Solitude Lake Management. He oversees large regional projects and coordinates with our local teams throughout the country to ensure environmental work is completed efficiently. Robin has a particular expertise in erosion control technologies for aging shorelines. Robin has a degree from Florida Southwestern University, um, and he is the president of the Florida Lake Management Society and a regular guest speaker on Sandcastle Radio, where he discusses all topics related to lake and pond management. Uh, we'll hear a lot from Robin later on in the presentation, and we have a great webinar planned for us all. So let's sit back and enjoy. Let's get started. So here's our agenda for the day. Um, I'll talk a little bit about what is erosion and how does it occur. We'll talk about uh, the dangers and the effects of erosion um, on water bodies in the surrounding areas. Uh, we'll really dive into the innovative innovation uh, shoreline or SOX restoration solution. And Robin will cover that as well as number four, He'll be giving some case studies of our SOX projects. I'll pass things back off to me. Uh, I'll be touching on some ongoing shoreline management strategies uh, that you should all know about that we offer at Solitude Lake Management. And we'll wrap up the presentation webinar with our questions and answers section. Let's kick things off with a discussion of defining what erosion is and how does it occur. Uh, first, here's our first poll question. Before we really dive into it, we'd like to understand who in our audience, um, who's in our audience, and what 
water bodies do you primarily work on or have or manage? So we're looking to see if you are more for a private lake or pond. Maybe it's a community lake or stormwater facility. Maybe you represent a golf course that has water bodies, a public lake or pond at a park possibly, or anything that we may have missed. So please take a moment, fill that out for us so we can get a better understanding of our audience today. All right, and we let everyone fill that, wrap that up. Looks like the majority of people uh, joining us today are with community lakes and stormwater ponds. Um, that's great, I, I do a lot of work uh, Robin as well on, on community lakes and stormwater ponds. Uh, so thanks for participating. Uh, now that we have a better idea of what water body uh, you are managing, let's jump into our discussion. So what is erosion and how does it occur exactly? It's a very common um, naturally occurring uh, event, erosion, although it's certainly accelerated in many cases by man. Uh, with our development of uplands, but erosion again, it's a common it's a common issue that um, affects most water bodies, not just lakes and ponds, but streams, and of course the coast. Uh, but today we'll be focusing mostly on ponds and lakes and stormwater facilities. Uh, like I said, it is a natural um, process that has occurred by wind, uh, rain, uh, rainfall, poor landscaping. Something we'll talk about later in the discussion how good vegetation and um, landscaping can uh, eliminate or reduce erosion concerns. Of course, cultural impacts, like I highlighted, uh, can have an effect or directly cause erosion. Um, you know, a mowing practice, how is uh, the vegetation around a basin being mowed or a lake could uh, potentially open yourself up for erosion concerns. And then the age of a lake or pond um, generally can uh, give us some indicators as to if erosion is a concern or not. So really what erosion is, is just the, it's just the wearing away of the shoreline in many cases. Um, and lakes and ponds, it'll start, it starts to form this steep slope, unstable banks, uh, deep washouts. We have a couple other examples coming up on the next slide. Um, but certainly humans uh, affect erosion um, greatly. Um, so just like I highlighted with development, you know, you are increasing uh, impervious surface and um, creating more water runoff during rain events, which creates more velocity uh, as water drains down to the lowest point. And unprotected soils uh, are really uh, vulnerable then uh, for erosion. And we're going to get into that deeply in this discussion. Uh, so we talked about what erosion is and how it occurs. Uh, let's show you uh, how you can identify it on your water body. So, and these pictures are great. You can see the receding banks. Um, you can see in the lower left hand uh, picture how the soil and silt has kind of sloughed, eroded, and migrated into the basin. Uh, on the right, you can see the very uneven and unstable uh, stable banks. Um, Some we'll talk a little, a little bit about is as erosion occurs and washing sediments and debris. I'm sorry, sediment and silt and such into your pond, it fills into your pond, which ultimately decreases the water depth or your carry capacity, which can be very important for stormwater facilities specifically, but definitely has an adverse effect on all water bodies as they fill up with unwanted sediments, silts, and so on. Um, so, how can this affect the, the water quality of a pond or lake? Well, you know, erosion can adversely affect uh, the habitat, um, you know, along the shoreline. Think of, we're going to discuss this in depth about vegetative buffers that comes up later. But the area right along the shoreline is habitat, um, not just for plants, uh, but for wildlife as well. And as erosion occurs and as sediments and, and silts get down into your pond, you know, silts, uh, nutrients come along with that material. So things like phosphorus and nitrogen, um, which are locked up in the sediments, they get into your pond and can cause a lot of concerns uh, we'll get into 
uh, in a moment. And then, like I discussed, reducing your volume and the depth of your basin. You know, as ponds, stormwater facilities specifically fill up with sediment, they cannot have the same storage or carrying capacity as they were designed for, which definitely affects their functionality, uh, as well as in natural ponds, it affects the ecosystem. Um, and, you know, that last bullet point there about potential development of algae, toxic algae, unwanted weeds, foul, foul orders, those all go hand in hand when erosion occurs. And like I said, that sediment and uh, nutrient rich sediments get down into your basin. That just drives the plant and algae cycle and really things can get out of control there. Uh, we can see how erosion affects the aesthetics of a water body, but we'd also like to the effects of the overall health of your pond. Oops. So erosion is not only bad for the health of your pond, but it can also pose some serious issues outside of the water body. So, you know, when a shoreline is unstable or uneven or compromised, you know, it can look pretty bad. Um, it can certainly decrease property value, just you know, by aesthetics. In some cases, you can lose property uh, due to erosion. Um, stormwater facilities, that picture in the middle is one of my projects where erosion uh, was not corrected uh, just below an inlet pipe. And eventually, the, that entire flared end section um, slipped off of its joint and fell right into the eroded area. So directly affecting the functionality of that facility. Um, it's definitely a, a concern if you're walking around banks and steep slopes, you could potentially slip and fall. Um, and it's really just an eyesore um, for homeowners, for members, uh, you know, just someone visiting a pond. Or, of course, if you're trying to play golf, uh, it's going to look pretty, pretty bad. As we've explained, erosion can have some damaging effects if not managed properly, which is why shoreline management should be top of mind when developing a lake and pond management plan. So let's talk about some solutions available that can help to restore your damaged shoreline and prevent future erosion. I'm gonna hand things over to Robin now. Uh, Robin's going to dive into our SOX shoreline stabilization services. And with that, Robin, why don't you take it away? Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for the intro and thanks for letting everybody know what we're gonna be talking about today. Uh, I think most importantly with any kind of shoreline restoration or erosion product or, or uh, solution that a community is looking at, they really wanna make sure that they pick a vendor that's committed to doing the job right and delivering a quality product. And that certainly is what Solitude is about to all of our customers. Um, and we're going to talk about several different uh, options uh, to uh, restore shorelines or protect shorelines. And the main two that we're going to talk about today are the SOX systems for rebuilding and restoring shoreline and then native planted vegetative shoreline buffers to uh, restore and protect shorelines as well. So the first thing we're going to talk about then is going to be the SOC systems. And some of the main benefits of, you know, installing the SOC systems is it immediately stops the erosion and you have a firm solid bank that you know, can be walked on, is safe, is usable. Uh, if it was in a high access area of the lake, you wouldn't have to keep it roped off or keep people off of it. As soon as the repair is done, uh, that, that area is usable and that erosion is stopped. Uh, it's an environmentally friendly solution since it is a living shoreline and will grow vegetation on that shoreline. You're allowed to have vegetation you know, it will allow you to have vegetation all the way down to the water's edge. And that vegetation will filter runoff and take nutrients out of the water that it comes into contact with. Um, and the SOX material itself is very long lasting. 
Uh, the material was developed about 20 years ago and some of the original projects up in uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin uh, where they were testing the material and the product are still uh, in place and still functioning. So it's, it's a, a long-term solution to an erosion problem. Uh, and it prevents the sediment from, you know, washing through it and into the water body. Uh, it, it catches the sediment, it contains the sediment that's inside the material, and it holds the sediments that are still in the bank uh, behind the material. So, so you are able to stop and prevent a lot of the sedimentation that's going on in the lake and the water body. And again, you, you end up with a natural living shoreline where you can have plants and vegetation all the way down to the water's edge, helping with that runoff and, and nutrient loading that's going into your pond. Um, next, let's talk about um, how, you know, we go about putting in socks. There is a process to it. Um, first, with the stakes are put back into the bank at a uh, point where you have stable ground. That's what anchors the, the system into the bank, creates the security, um, and the sock material is actually tied uh, to all those stakes um, and then folded over. So what you're left with is, you know, two, two rows of stakes, a top and a bottom section of the sock that basically is creating uh, a taco or an envelope for you to put the material into uh, to fill that sock and, and rebuild and restore that bank. Um, and again, all the stakes and rope hold that system to the embankment. And then you're able to plant uh, either sod or native plants right over the sock uh, or directly into the sock. If, if you see the picture on the far right hand of your screen, we actually did both. Uh, we, we, install, we installed sod right over the sock, which grows directly through the sock material uh, down to a uh, high water line. And then we planted native grasses directly through the sock, which that photos uh, soon after the, the small plugs were installed, but those plugs will cover and fill that front edge of the sock to create uh, a more natural look uh, that a lot of people like besides just the grass right down to the water's edge. But the socks material gives you both of those options. So what are some of the benefits of socks? So we touched on this earlier. It is a long lasting material. Uh, again, it's been in in some situations for you know as many as 20 years. So it is the material itself lasts a long time. Uh, it's very, very uh, customizable in that if you have small areas it, it can it can work for small areas it's customizable in that you can uh, gain back a significant amount of your your shoreline or bank if you look at the before and after pictures on your screen right now uh, you can see uh, there's there's a chain link fence and a bush that's in the picture that's actually overhanging into the water in the before picture and in the after picture, you can see that there's several feet of shoreline that extend back into the lake uh, beyond that fence and bush. So you're allowed to sew panels together and really customize the material for what you're trying to do for any specific project, as opposed to working with some type of preformed material where, you know, the way it is when you get it is what you're stuck with when you fill it up and it's in the lake. Uh, and again, you're able to immediately then uh, sod or vegetate over that repair, uh, allow your, your plants to, to grow into that new surface and begin filtering uh, any runoff water and any nutrients that they come into contact with. And that's 
you know, you don't, there is no wait time. You're allowed to do that. You know, you're able to do that immediately after your repair. So you end up with a finished product uh, very quickly. So with that, uh, we have some case studies that we'll talk about and, and talk about some of the different ways that socks can be used and the benefits they provide. The first uh, case study that we'll talk about was uh, very, very far south Florida. I know we have uh, people from all over the country on this phone call joining us. Uh, this was uh, Florida City, which is as far down south in Florida as you can get before you cross over into the Florida Keys. Uh, and this community had very, very severe uh, lake bank erosion over the years to the point that some of the residents weren't even able to walk behind the back of their home because literally the shoreline had eroded all the way back to the back of their house. Um, they couldn't walk around the back of the homes and, and you know, if the erosion would have continued, uh, they could have had uh, danger to some of those homes on the property. Uh, the, the bank was very steep. You couldn't walk on it. Uh, in places, it was probably as much as a 10-foot drop-off. So this project utilized 18-foot uh, and 20-foot uh, sock material to, you know, rebuild that bank as needed to create, you know, more of a gradual slope and to also rebuild that bank out from the homes. In the left-hand picture, you see the before picture, the, the sock material is starting to be installed around the perimeter of the lake, being staked off, tied off. Uh, in the middle photo, the during photo, what you're looking at there is the sock material has been staked off and tied off and it's starting to be filled. And that's why you see the, the bank being rebuilt and extending back out into the lake with more of a gradual slope. And then your far right picture uh, is your after photo. Uh, it, it, on the left hand side of that photo, you see it's already been sodded over. In the right hand side of that after photo, you can still see some of the sock material where the, the repair hasn't come all the way around the lake yet. But we were able in this community to actually rebuild so much of the bank behind these properties that they went from not being able to walk behind some of the homes to us actually being able to create a walking path uh, around this entire lake on that rebuilt bank behind all the homes for all the residents of the community to uh, enjoy. Uh, with that, our next project was in uh, Tampa, Florida. And I should also, say on that last slide, in that particular situation, we imported all of that material that we used to fill that sock. Uh, that's the difference between some of these three slides that we're gonna show. So that first slide, all that material to fill the sock was imported. The second case study in Tampa, Florida, um, as you see, this, this particular community did not have much of a uh, drop-off issue. Uh, like the first uh, study that we looked at, but they had lost a significant amount of their shoreline. Uh, the The residents that had been here for years said they had lost, you know, six to eight feet of their shoreline. They were more worried about all that material that had ended up in the lake over the years and that the lake was no longer holding the amount of stormwater it was designed to hold and that they were losing some of their yards. So in this situation, uh, we used a, a 12 foot sock. We installed it around the entire perimeter of the lake and we pumped all of the material that we used to fill this system out of the lake. So we pumped all of the sand and sediment that over the years had washed into this lake um, from these people's yards, and we were able to use that to fill the sock, rebuild that shoreline back out. As you can see in the picture, it was 
approximately five to six feet all the way around the lake. And you can see in the picture that, you know, you see someone standing right on that rebuilt bank uh, as we're filling the sock. So you end up with a very sturdy, stable repair right away. Um, and then in the after photo, you can see that the, that the repair was sodded over right down to the water line. And you can see how much of the bank they got back just from the difference in the, the sod that was there, you know, prior to the repair and the new sod that you see is a slightly different color in the photo. So the community was able to, you know, do two things with one project, which was, you know, get a lot of that material out of the lake that had uh, eroded into the lake over the years and sedimented uh, into the lake, causing it to be able to hold less of the stormwater. And they were also able to reclaim a lot of the bank and yards that they had lost over the years. So the next project that we're going to talk about, we actually have a video that we're going to play to kind of introduce this project. And then I will come back at the end of the video and uh, add a few more uh, points to it. Uh, and, and again, if you are on a phone, I don't believe the audio will work. Um, if you aren't on computer audio, I'm sorry. Uh, but it should have subtitles if for some reason you are not able to get the uh, video audio to play through your system. In this video, see how Solitude Lake Management transformed the eroded and dangerous lake banks of a premier sporting community into a beautiful living shoreline. This South Carolina sporting community in the heart of Low Country offers the perfect backdrop for nature lovers seeking authentic experiences on and near the water. Community residents have front row access to 3,500 acres of Huntland's fresh and saltwater fishing impoundments, and miles of unspoiled marshes. Unfortunately, due to the community's positioning along the East Coast, wind and rain have caused the bank along certain fishing impoundments to erode over time, creating drop-offs ranging from 18 inches to four feet. The community considered a number of erosion control solutions, including bulkheads and riprap, but had concerns that such options would detract from the natural landscape. The aquatic management professionals at Solitude then introduced them to SOX erosion control technology. Unlike traditional options, this patented mesh system can be seamlessly installed to create a living shoreline in a harmonious transition from water to land. Solitude's team of professionals spent nine days installing a 12-foot wide sock system along 1,000 linear feet of shoreline. For water bodies located on the property. This particular lake is relied upon for fishing and also serves as a focal point for a horseback riding trail that runs parallel to the site. A mechanical hydro rake was used to scoop eroded sediment out of the water body and deposit it on shore for integration into the sock system. In addition to increasing depth in the water body through hydro raking, the use of an on-site sediment, as opposed to trucked in dirt, helped reduce overall project expenses. Once filled with sediment, the sock system was shaped to integrate naturally into the existing shoreline. The Solitude team made additional considerations to extend the length of key pipes and drains located within the bank. 
Another amazing benefit of the stock system is that once in place, grass, native vegetation, and buffer plants can be installed directly into the mesh, creating a beautiful wall of plants. The community was extremely pleased with the ease and fast-paced transformation of the eroded banks into a beautiful living shoreline that is now safe for recreational use. Like this video on YouTube if you want to see more case studies from Solitude. Follow us on social media to hear from our experts on the latest lake and pond management innovations and best practices. All right, hope everyone enjoyed that video. Uh, this was a great project that we did up in South Carolina. And uh, this project had a pretty severe drop off along the edge of it. I don't wanna to restate too much of what was said in the video, uh, but we were able to use the material out of the lake again to uh, fill the sock and rebuild the bank. And this community was looking for a very native shoreline similar to what they had in the before picture that you see on the left hand side of your screen where they had a lot of the native grasses and things growing right from the shoreline into the edge of the lake they were just trying to rebuild some of the bank and get rid of the drop off that you see in the the photo uh, to have more of a gradual transition from the bank into the lake uh, the middle picture you see, we were able to use the material that we had, you know, been able to reclaim from the lake with the hydro rake that you saw in the video, and then rinse that material into the sock to fill the sock and compact it and rebuild that bank. Uh, and then in the far right picture, we then sodded over that repair back down to that uh, high water line and then transitioned into more of the native plants to kind of recreate the look that the lake had had uh, before we started the repair. Uh, and with that, I will uh, turn this uh, back over to John. He's gonna talk to you about uh, some of the native planting uh, vegetation bank options. That was great, Robin. Uh, thank you so much. Um, some really great projects there that your team and our team at Solitude Lake Management have had the pleasure of working on. Um, so what I'm going to talk about is the vegetation and how vegetative buffers uh, can be so important um, for your shoreline, and especially if you're looking to correct erosion um, along the shorelines. Um, if you're using the socks system, um, you can plant directly through that fabric. Uh, because it is a, a knitted fabric, okay, as opposed to much of the other similar products out there that are woven, that knit uh, gives it really, really strong structural integrity. Um, and that allows us to puncture it. And in places we can put plants, and you saw in those pictures, those plug grasses. Um, so that's one uh, great feature of socks. Now with that, you know, you've got to understand using small plants, it takes time for them to grow and mature. Um, but the socks platform is wonderful for those plants to really grow and proliferate, be protected, uh, certainly from additional erosion occurring as they are getting established. Um, you do have to understand that when you develop a, a buffer around a pond, uh, it, it does take time for them to mature, and it also takes time to uh, cultivate and, and allow it the whole buffer to establish. Uh, I typically like to use indigenous aquatic grasses, sedges, rushes, and other beneficial perennial flowering species. I like to think of a buffer in two zones, okay? You have right from the shoreline, and you have upland, all right, that's your terrestrial buffer. And like three feet minimum would be great, five feet, 10 feet, even better. But that's the entire terrestrial buffer, uh, mostly grasses and perennial flowers. And that helps, you know, to filter water as it sheet flows into the pond. 
those plants can take up some of those unwanted nutrients before ever entering the pond. And then from the shoreline into the water, okay, uh, that's the aquatic uh, environment and what's known as the littoral zone. And that's where you put in um, those true aquatic hydrophytic plants like pickerel weed or duck, pote duck potato, for example. Uh, but at Solo 2 Lake Management, we use a variety of native uh, indigenous plants whenever possible, and that's what we recommend. Um, you know, by establishing that buffer around the pond, you can really improve aesthetics as well as correcting or preventing a future erosion from the shoreline. But, you know, what we try to do at Solo 2 is create ecological balance, and that's a great first step by creating that vegetative buffer. Not only are you going to protect your water body, but you're promoting beneficial uh, wildlife, birds uh, to inhabit that area and create just that, a really nice ecosystem uh, for your lake pond and in many cases, stormwater facilities too. Um, I do want to stress that if you're not, if you do not have a nice vegetative buffer around lakes and ponds, you know, you're opening yourself up for additional unwanted nutrients to run into your pond and collect during stormwater, which of course creates a struggle uh, when you're trying to battle persistent algae growth or unwanted plants uh, in your pond due to the uh, excessive nutrients that the buffer could have helped uh, reduce. Uh, geese, geese uh, if you don't have a nice buffer um, around the lake or pond, you sometimes will have uh, migratory geese or even resident geese setting up shop at your pond. Uh, a, a nice buffer around your pond can help deter geese from roosting in your pond. Uh, but really, most importantly, that rooting system either incorporated with a sock system or just uh, along the banks, having nice vegetation around your shoreline can help stabilize those soils and reduce uh, the concern for erosion. Next, I'd like to talk about some other methods that are available for erosion control. Uh, socks, you see socks versus geotubes. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with geotubes installing them. I do have a lot of experience uh, correcting geotubes once they fail. Uh, I talked about that knitted fabric that comes with the sock. That's that patent and technology that really impresses me and why I like to use sock. It's so strong. Uh, geotubes, they unfortunately do not have that same integrity. Um, with socks, you know, you can really create that living shoreline. Um, you can, it's very pliable. You can make different types of meanders. You can move it around docks or you saw in the one example around the pipe. Or anything. That's really easy to do with sock. Um, you can also correct very steep slopes with sock, um, where it's not, you can't really do that with geotubes, or at least I have not seen that implemented. Um, and geotubes come in that preformed type of uh, structure, and so you're limited to that. Whereas I said, you know, socks is very pliable, and you can really create any type of shoreline you, you're looking to create or recreate. Um, it's really the integrity uh, of the sock that impresses me because it's it's that knitted fabric. Uh, it's very durable. Um, the examples that Robin gave were great. Uh, and, and another nice thing about the sock is that it's really easy to repair. Uh, I said, you know, people call me because their geotubes have failed, and now they're looking for a remediation solution. And um, socks, although I haven't seen them fail, uh, if they were to fail, maybe due to, uh, say, human interaction, like a lawnmower were to slice it somehow, um, you can easily mend a sock, a socks project, by knitting it in even a large repair need, you could just cut out a section and literally, uh, you know, sew in a new section of sock, uh, which is really great for um, correcting concerns along a, a bank like that. So there are some other erosion control solutions out there available. I can talk about those. I have a lot more experience with, with these three. Uh, riprap and rock on the left uh, will always have a place uh, around most ponds. Um, specifically stormwater facilities. Uh, but rock, you know, has its maintenance needs. You can't keep rock looking that nice and clean unless you have a very intense weed management program. Uh, rock will migrate. Um, 
it will move around, so you really have to keep it in place. And, you know, there's nothing living or subjective, but very uh, appealing aesthetically about rock. So I'm not a huge fan of rock for complete armoring around the basin, like in the example on the left. Uh, bulkheads that can really get expensive to install. Um, they do have a similar concern with if they fail. I have seen bulkheads bulge out, and the corrective actions for them are, are quite can get quite costly. Uh, but they do have their their place. Um, and on the right, those coconut logs, or uh, sometimes referred to as core logs, are really the one that's been around for a while uh, when you're trying to correct uh, erosion. And, and, and similar to the geotubes, you know, they can fail. I see them fail a lot. Um, I also don't like those stakes. Um, they, they, you always see the stakes when you're installing those coconut core logs. They can be a tripping hazard. Um, and, um, you know, the, the integrity of it is nothing compared to sock. Uh, whereas the sock I talked about, if it were to get a tear, uh, you know, that's just going to be very small. Core log, you get a small tear, and then over time, it just completely fails. Uh, I do want to say, you know, there are a lot of examples or uh, alternative erosion control solutions out there, as I just described. But SOC is our premium uh, solution for shoreline stabilization at Solitude Lake Management. These erosion control solutions in mind, let's review the importance of shoreline management. Maintaining a healthy shoreline, stabilized shoreline, is not only important for your water body um, and the health of the water quality, uh, but the lifespan of your pond. Um, you know, I think that's what we described throughout the presentation. You know, as erosion occurs, it just washes into the, the basin, the pond, the lake, and um, that's going to affect the lifespan. Um, you know, in nature, <laughs> As lakes and ponds fill up over time, thousands of years, they create a wetland. That's how it works. Um, and that's exactly what you're seeing at a very small level with erosion and accumulation of sediment in that basin. Just like you take care of a lawn, a uh, lake, uh, lake or stormwater management pond, it's an ongoing commitment that requires different approaches throughout the year. And those are great topics, like things that the uh, folks at Solitude Lake Management love discussing with their clients. Uh, it's important that you analyze your lake and pond throughout the year to make sure that you are uh, catching those erosion problems early. I like to describe it as in their infancy. You know, if you can correct or identify a small erosional rill or a small eroded bank uh, while it's small in its infancy, it can be corrected uh, at a, a much lower dollar amount than if you know the, the problem persists and now a couple big storms have come through and your small erosion problem has become a big erosion problem i love this one about socks socks can be implemented over time to fit your budget and then you know we talked about how it can be um, sewn in you can sew in new sections uh, if you have a thousand linear foot project you don't have to take on that entire thousand foot uh, in one one shot. You could phase a, an install for socks uh, over several years potentially. Just, you know, spread out that cost over a few years. A lot easier to budget for a project that way. So instead of doing a thousand feet at a time for X amount, let's take on a hundred or two hundred linear feet per year, and then come in when we have the budget the next year. So in that next section, you keep moving down the shoreline until it's completely reestablished. Um, and whether your water body is in pretty good shape or it's at the point where a SOX solution uh, really needs to be employed, it's always a good idea to get ahead of erosion before the damaging effects take a toll on its water body. This has been a great topic. Uh, that is the, the, the heart of our presentation. And we're going to move into a questions and answers section now. So this is uh, an opportunity. Many of you have sent some great questions. Thank you uh, throughout the presentation. And uh, I'm going to let uh, Robin and myself field some of these questions. Uh, Robin, you ready? I got the first one for you. Yep, go ahead. All right, great. Um, this one's uh, close to home. Larry in Florida, uh, he asks, how do you know when it's time to rebuild your shoreline? 
That's a great question. I think you really have two different things you could be looking at, kind of like what you saw in the uh, test cases that we spoke about. One, you could just have a gradual loss of shoreline where you saw that you had less and less of your yard or less and less of your park, or you used to be able to get a lawnmower between your tree and the lake, and now you can't anymore because there's no space left there. Or the second thing would be that you start seeing an extreme drop off at the edge of, at the edge of your shoreline where you used to have a nice gradual slope. Now you have, you know, 10 inches or a foot or, more of a drop off. Th those are really two of the big signs that you could look at pretty easily uh, to determine if you're having an erosion problem. If it's a new property that you're not familiar with, maybe you just moved in and you're, you really don't know what the property looked like 10 years ago. Uh, a lot of times if you see uh, pipes or outfall structures that are extending out into a lake, that look like they have some sort of head wall or something that should have been integrated into the bank. Maybe it's a, an angled cut on a pipe and now that's kind of sticking out into the lake all by itself. That's another good indicator if you don't have any background to go off of. Yeah, that's a great explanation. And then of course, anytime you, know, you want to contact us direct at Solitude Lake Management, you know, we'd be happy to make an assessment of your shoreline to you know, give you uh, that information. If it, maybe it is time to take some corrective uh, measures. Thanks, Robin. Uh, I can field this next one from Teresa. She's from Virginia. Uh, I think you touched on this in your presentation, uh, some of your slides, but is it possible to create a living shoreline on a lake uh, where there's no gradual slope? So it's just a drop off of two or three feet. And Robin, I think in the one project example, you know, it, it varied from 18 inches to the four feet, uh, but Teresa, the, the answer is yes. Uh, what's great about sock specifically is you can stack sock on top of each other, um, sometimes even creating like a staircase effect if needed. Uh, I know we're looking at the one project in Pennsylvania where it's like a 20 foot a cut, and we're, you know, we'd like to use sock there. Uh, so, really, um, it, yeah, it, you can correct very steep slopes uh, with sock. Um, so yes, I think that answers that one. Uh, Robin, I got another one from Florida if you want it. Uh, Matt, he asks, um, he has some, oh, this is a good one. He has a past experience with shore sock. And I guess he wants to know if there's a difference between the product you're talking about and shore sock. I think it's a good one, please clarify. That is a good question. And uh, shore socks was kind of the first product that socks, came out with uh, and started introducing to the market. And it was a single uh, layer of material that was typically filled with some sort of soft media that would harden up over time. Uh, it, it typically didn't utilize material out of the lake uh, to, to fill that sock and recreate that bank. The uh, new material that's being used is, is a double layer of material. Uh, it's much stronger and you're, you're typically using material out of the lake or you're importing some sort of sand or soil to, to fill the sock if the material in the lake can't be used. So that shoreline is stable right from day one and can be sodded over and walked on and used. Uh, from, from the time the repair is completed, whereas some of the old initial shore socks applications stayed soft for extended periods of time. So they made a good product and improved on it and made it even better? Yes, that's correct. Nice. All right, Matt, hopefully that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, I'll hit you up again, Robin. Uh, not from Florida, from Kentucky, Sean asks, what are the best ways to limit soil erosion during our high rainy seasons? Or our rainy season? That's a frequent question that we get regarding uh, socks and erosion repair. Uh, 
so the the socks material itself uh is very uh porous and will dewater very quickly so if it was just a situation where uh the rain was going to have to go you know laterally through the sock in a groundwater situation the sock would never back that water up it would pass directly through the sock into the lake uh no problem uh many times however you see that rain erosion you know surface erosion from from rain is coming from a point source maybe it's a downspout of a house or the corner of a parking lot or tennis courts or a pool area and in so sometimes in those situations you know just repairing the bank itself won't actually stop the erosion where it's starting at so you may have to put in some sort of drain or catch basin at that source and then pipe that water you know down through the yard or park or area uh through the sock and into the edge of the lake and get it off the surface of that ground so that it doesn't prevent future erosion above the sock and the bank repair excellent thank you <clears throat> got a lot of great questions coming in here i'm gonna have to uh be selective. I have one. I think I could handle this from Casey in California, and uh, just reiterate because I think again your project uh, example described this, but I'm curious about how long it takes to install uh, some of these projects. And I think in your project example in South Carolina for a thousand feet, uh, you did it in uh, eight days, nine days, and I think the project you just did for us up in New Jersey, same about thousand feet or eight hundred feet. I think you did it in eight days. Um, so, you know, of course, it's linear footage, which would depend on how, how quickly the installation could be. But that's two examples of pretty decent sized projects and our turnaround, what our turnaround was. And here's where I want to really drive home why I like this product. And that is that you can do it over phases. Um, and, you know, that's going to be helpful for your budget, but for timing as well. So, for you know, for whatever reason, if you have a limited amount of time to do a project like this, you could bite off, so to speak, a chunk of stock or shoreline to stabilize within that amount of time that you have. It's very easy, easy to do it that way. Um, Robin, here's one James asks from New York. Maybe you can answer this one. How do you select the appropriate types of plants to determine the density of plants for the shoreline buffer? Well, I guess I could have answered that one as well, but you want to take a stab at it? Sure. Anytime you're looking at planting a buffer around a lake, uh, both for density of plants and types of plants, you need to consider what your water depth that you're trying to plant is in is, uh, what the typical water level fluctuations of the lake are, uh, and how quickly you want the planting to fill in. Uh, so, if you have several years to allow planting to fill in, you might be able to space the appropriate plants, say three feet on center, and within three to five years, you might have 80% coverage of that area filled in. If, like a lot of uh, HOAs and things, the, the homeowners wanna see a finished product within a year or less, uh, talking about the plants filling in, uh, you may have to plant those plants considerably closer, uh, you know, one foot on center or less. And obviously, too, that depends on where in the country you live and what your growing season is. Here in Florida, things grow a lot quicker than they do up in uh, Maine. Uh, so, you know, that, that would vary from region to region, and so would the plant species. So if you wanted to follow up on that specific question i think your best bet would be to reach out to one of your local uh solitude uh reps that could come out visit your site see what you were dealing with get some feedback on what you were trying to accomplish with your planning uh, and give you some real specific advice for your specific pond yeah that's great this is a huge topic for us up in the northeast you know with installing plants i also you know I, I do definitely think the spacing you know is very budget driven because plants come in several different sizes 
you know, so with larger plants come a higher budget. And the last thing I usually add is, well, what colors do you like? You know, because if you're trying to establish a buffer, you can sometimes select the plant with certain colors that really, you know, are what the client is really looking for. Uh, my example is I had some clients in Maryland that really love the color yellow. So we went with a lot of black eyed Susan. Um, but that, it can be that customizable as well. Um, I have one from Roma here. Does, how does socks handle beaver or muskrat burrowing? Um, so I'm going to take a stab at this one, Robin. Um, if the beaver or muskrat has been removed uh, and they're no longer burrowing uh, in your banks, uh, socks can absolutely be a solution for correcting their burrows. Uh, same with uh, beaver, but with any type of nuisance, uh, you know, animal like that, or that's living in, in a stormwater pond or a basin, you, you know, you got to, you know, remove the animal, make sure that they're not going to continue their activity, but correcting what they've destroyed uh, is certainly something that stocks can, can handle perfectly. Would you agree? I would agree with that. And I would also add that I think, uh, you know, any type of animal, uh, especially with sharp teeth or claws, could potentially damage a sock, uh, even if they weren't there at the time you installed the sock. But again, if that damage occurred and you were able to get the animal out of there, uh, it would be easy to repair. And also the sock material is pretty sturdy. So I would, I would think if there was another area they could go to where they could burrow easier and have better access, they would just choose to go to that area and leave the sock system alone. Yeah, and, and then again, with like what's so great about this product is if that were to occur, so like an animal comes back in and tears a section, it's not like the entire project is now compromised. You, in some cases, I know you're just actually sewing up the, 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 the tear right there. In larger sections, you cut that section out, and then you can put in, sew in a new section uh, very uh, cost effectively. Um, how, about, how about time of year, Robin? Um, uh, Dozy asks, uh, is there a preferred time of year for shoreline restoration projects? I know in the Northeast, you know, you might not be able to put plants in the ground or sod over the winter, but you're still able to do some of the, the work. Is that correct? What is your preferred timeline or seasonality to do SOX projects? We're pretty flexible. I, uh, I know we're running short on time here, so I'll try to keep my answer brief. But, uh, you know, we can work in high water level if required. It's obviously best if we can get a better look at the erosion and what we're repairing. So uh, a normal water level or low water level would be preferred. Uh, and like John said, if it's seasonal and we can't, you know, saw it over the sock, it is going to delay the total completion of the repair. Um, but we can work. I mean, unless your lake is frozen over uh, and, and ice, we, we can work and do the repair. We just may have to come back and do some finish ups after the fact. That's what we like to do at Solo 2 Lake Management. We like to uh, provide a great product. Um, and uh, help our clients through projects like this. Uh, Robin, uh, this is gonna conclude our presentation for the day. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time and thank you all for joining us. I hope you learned something. Again, this uh, webinar will be um, provided as, on a link on our website and I believe everyone on the call is going to get that link emailed directly to them. Uh, please don't hesitate to reach out to any of us at Solo 2 Lake Management. If you'd like to learn more, about this topic uh, or any of the lake management uh, services uh, that we offer at Solo 2 Lake Management. Thank you and stay safe.